I will get my slides set up. Um, so it's fantastic to see you all introducing yourself in chat. It's great to get a sense of who's in our virtual room today to get an idea of what organisations you're from and various levels of experience around social media and digital marketing. Now, if you can just give me a thumbs up or a yes in chat, if you can see my slides okay now, just make sure they're coming through uh, for everybody okay. That would be amazing. Thank you very much, Lindy. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate the update. Awesome. So as Sam said, what I'm going to be talking about today is specifically about how we tell our stories digitally. And this is a really powerful topic when we're talking about how do we bounce back from what's happened in 2020. The reality is whether you're in Australia or you're in the US uh, or Canada, what has happened in the last year is charities have been hit harder than anyone else. The stats show us that while you, a lot of you have had an increase in demand for your services, you've had a decrease in revenue, you've had a decrease in opportunities for face-to-face -face events, for fundraising and all those important things. Particularly here in Australia, we kicked off last year with raging bushfires and huge fundraising campaigns, then to go into lockdown and suddenly have a lot of charities heavily impacted. In fact, here in Australia, they're estimating as many as 17% of not-for-profits in our country will close by the end of September, which is a very very terrifying statistic. So it's amazing to have organisations like Killer who are stepping up to help organisations bounce back from what's been going on. And personally for me, I believe social media can change the world. I believe if you can get your social media working well, you have a virtual platform. You have an online community that you can motivate towards any outcome, whether it's volunteer recruitment, attracting customers, or of course, raising money and getting donations. So this presentation is really a good fundamental look at how we actually use social media effectively as a cause organization. Now, I love a lot of interactions. So at any point, if you have questions or you have comments or you just wanna go, yes, I'm liking this, please do interact with me in chat. And I would love to chat with all of you as we progress. There is no such thing as a silly question, particularly when it comes to social media. So if I use a term you don't know, or there's something else you wanna ask more about, please dive in and do ask those questions. And then we'll use what time we have left at the end to uh, go through any q and I might've missed. Now I do talk quickly. I am very passionate. I will talk fast. Uh, as Sam said at the start, you will get a recording and you will get slides but please do bear with me because I do have quite a bit to cover in a short period of time. If I'm going too quick, give me the heads up. So you're in the right place right now. If you are somebody who knows social media has a lot of potential, but maybe you're still just a little bit nervous that you might get it wrong and something might happen terribly on social media for your organization. Or maybe if you just want to understand what is the power and potential of social media, particularly when it comes to fundraising and bouncing back from what's happened in the last year. So what I'm gonna talk about is what I call the three pillars of social media. Now I use this graphic for a very simple reason. It's because when we talk about pillars, essentially these three posts are holding up the roof. If any one of these posts are missing, your roof's gonna collapse. And that's what often happens with social media for not-for-profits. We have a couple of things right and working really well. We don't realize we're just missing one piece of the puzzle. And if we can just pull that one thing into alignment, everything changes. So the three pillars I'm gonna talk about today are our where, our who, and our what. So where is which social media platforms should you be using right now in 2021 and why? I'm gonna talk about who, who you're talking to online and why that's actually incredibly important for you to understand to get good results, particularly when we wanna fundraise. And I'm gonna talk about what. I'm gonna teach you a really simple four point strategy for creating compelling social media content that drives outcomes. Awesome. Loving the interaction I'm getting in chat already. Good on you, thumbs up from Isabel. Um, a little bit about me, so quick bit of background. So I spent about 15 years as a journalist and a magazine editor. So I did mainly lifestyle writing. So I've interviewed people like Adele, Matt Damon, Sylvester Stallone, uh, kind of people in that wheelhouse. And I had the great pleasure of being able to travel around the world, um, doing a lot of research and, and getting to meet a lot of incredible people. So when I talk about coming from the point of storytelling, that's kind of where it came from, that kind of journalism and media background. But now, obviously pre-pandemic, when I was traveling, I see my job as 
uh, traveling around, meeting amazing people and taking the very best information in what's going on in the world of social media and then translating it to the not-for-profit, charity and social enterprise space. Because the reality is a lot of your organizations are almost upside down. So the advice that's given for small business or corporate often doesn't really work for a not-for-profit or charity. So that's a big part of what I do. So this photo I took uh, when I was in uh, South by Southwest over in Austin, Texas, uh, right before the pandemic. Uh, these guys are actually the people who started Instagram. So I got a chance to learn from them, which was amazing. Um, I've learned from people like Gary V, uh, who's currently the world's foremost specialist in social media. Uh, when I was in Singapore, I've spent time with Randy Zuckerberg, who was the head of marketing for Facebook for the first 10 years, and of course, Mark's sister. And um, hung out with people like Guy Kawasaki, who was the head evangelist or marketing officer for Apple. So when I'm teaching you social media in this session, you can uh, rest assured that the information I'm sharing is coming right from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So uh, Sam's excited by Gary V. Yeah, Gary's an um, interesting dude. He's someone who you love or hate for sure. But I've had um, the great pleasure of being able to pick his brain a few times about the not-for-profit space and the social media trends. Now, um, the thing I love about what I get to do is the impact that you have. So I've had the great pleasure of working with not-for-profits of all levels and all sizes all around the world. Um, I'm based in Australia, but I have clients in Australia, New Zealand, the US, uh, India, South America, Southeast Asia, so all over the world and everyone from very tiny not-for-profits that are run by volunteers, like someone like Tiny Sparks, to large organizations like the Red Cross or Starlight Children's Foundation or Lifeline or one of the bigger brands that you might recognize. But what I love about what I do is that I can just nerd out about social media and the things and storytelling and the things I enjoy, but it's you applying these lessons that actually creates real change in the world. So that's what I get most excited about. So I wanna make sure you're applying what you're learning in this session today so it's super practical and hands-on. Now, one of the most important things when it comes to storytelling, any type of storytelling, but particularly when we talk about digital, is this is the secret to getting it right. It's really simple. You've got to tell the right story, right place, the right people at the right time. Now, sounds super easy, but often one of these things might be missed. Maybe you're using the wrong platform or maybe your messaging isn't quite connecting with people yet. Maybe you're not as clear as you need to be about who your target market is and you're keeping your content too broad. Or maybe you're just even posting at the wrong time of day. So that's what I really want to help you understand. How do we get these four elements right with our storytelling? All right, let's get stuck in um, straight away with the first step, which is our where. Now, first of all, I just want you to see the potential of social media. Like if we look at the Australia tourism page, it has nearly 8 million followers already. So that's one of the powers of social media, the potential to bring together such a large community that you can then motivate wherever you need them to go for your organization. And too many people tell me that they're not for profit, their story is not sexy. What they need to do is not something people wanna share on social. I just wanna break that um, mindset really early on. This is a campaign where people encouraged people to take a photo of their hands um, after they'd been having a uh, blood test for the pinprick test for HIV. If you can think of the least sexy thing you could share on your Instagram feed, it would be the fact you just had a HIV test. Yet this campaign actually reached 1.2 million views in just four hours. So don't think that your cause cannot be suitable for social media because believe me, there's all kinds of things that are. For example, I worked with um, SHQ in Perth, WA, and they wanted to get more teenagers using their sexual health clinic. We created this emoji campaign and they actually tripled the number of people booking into their clinic in just 30 days. So any type of message is appropriate for social. Another thing I want to address up front is that a lot of people in our space get a little bit overwhelmed by how big and complicated social media can be. This is something called the social media prism and it is intense. This shows you just the biggest social media platforms that are out there in the world right now. And it's not even all of them, not even anywhere close, but it shows you all the different segments that can still fall into the banner of social media. 
I want to focus on today, what is most effective and working right now for organizations like yours? So I'm not going to talk about every social media platform because we would actually be here for two days and not for an hour. Um, but I want you to know that you're always better off doing one or two social media platforms really well and getting really good results from that than trying to spread yourself too thin across all of them. So why social media? The reality is there's nowhere else where you can get to people for such a, a focused amount of time that frequently for free as you can with social media. And this data is quite old now, but we can see the amount of time that people spend just on the platform of Facebook per week. It's crazy. And if we look at our global social media use over time, the reality is in the last 12 months, we've gained nearly half a billion new social media users in the last year. And this comes from the Hootsuite and We Are Social digital social report of 2021. So you can see we've grown 13.2% worldwide in our use of social media. And that's obviously because of the pandemic and more and more people have gotten online. All right, let's talk about the world's most used social media platforms. Now, depending where you're logging in from, I saw a lot of you are from Australia. <clears throat> so I've got some stats related to the Australian market. Some of you from the US, obviously usage of different platforms is higher and lower, not just in different countries, but even within different states or different niche markets and communities. So that's something to be really aware of. But around the world, by far the biggest platform is Facebook. Um, so it's one of the things I talk about the most uh, with not-for-profits and causes. But there are a lot of other opportunities out there with different social media platforms. So we can see Instagram is still really high. Um, so is TikTok. So is Twitter. So is LinkedIn. And when we look at, um, you know, the US versus Australia, those numbers will change in different countries. These are the percentage of Australians currently that are using which social media platform, just to give you some context. So 91% of all social media users in Australia right now are active Facebook users. So that is a huge chunk of the population. It drops to 51% from YouTube. I don't talk about YouTube a lot with our not-for-profits, mainly because YouTube takes often a lot more time, a lot more skill set and often a lot more money to do well than one of the other platforms that I'll talk about today that you can do with pretty low budgets, pretty low resources and pretty low tech knowledge as well. So Instagram is the next biggest, then Snapchat, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. Um, if we look at the US and North American market, you'll find those numbers are generally higher. So usage of LinkedIn and Twitter are around 30% of the population. So it just goes up a little bit more in North America, a little bit more spread across different platforms. One of the barriers a lot of people tell me as well is that their audience isn't on social. So your audience is older or too young, et cetera. Well, I just wanted to blow that out of the water a little bit. This is Facebook users by demographic in Australia right now, just indicative. Um, and in fact, 65% of our pre-boomers, which in Australia are kind of our retirees, um, are active social media users now. So the reality is it does cover all ages and all demographics pretty thoroughly. Again, this is Australian data, but we start to look at different usage in different genders and different ages. So if I was um, talking to you and you were saying, which social media platform should we be using? What I'd be asking instead is who's your target market? And then actually looking at these kind of reports like the digital report from We Are Social and Hootsuite and figuring out exactly where your target market is hanging out right now, because usage in different age groups change. So I'm going to recommend you double down on a Facebook strategy if your target market is over the age of 60, because 91% of people in that age group are that are social media users are heavy users on Facebook now. So this kind of data is really useful to making those decisions. Likewise, um, and again, this would be the same in the US, but if you even look at between states, the platforms that we use can change really dramatically. So if you're in Tasmania, you've got 6% of your social media users are active LinkedIn users versus 25% if you're in Victoria or New South Wales. So that's a really big difference. So when I'm working with a client in Tassie, I'm not going to recommend they double down on LinkedIn the same way I would someone in New South Wales or Victoria. So these are the, some of the things I look at when I answer the question of where should I be investing my time on social? The next part is understanding where your audience hangs out and understanding the opportunities that are on the different platforms. 
So when someone goes, should I be on Instagram? It's like, well, who are you trying to reach and what are you trying to say? That is the most important thing to decide on why I would use one over another. So if we look at individual platforms, again, this data is uh, Australian right now. Our New Zealand uh, data is very, very similar in terms of percentage of population. And the US, if anything, some of our numbers are obviously much higher because the population is higher. Now, when I look at Facebook, we have 16.5 million active Australian social media users right now. The strength and the weakness of Facebook is the same. The strength is that it has such a huge audience. So many people are there, but the weakness is that so many people are there, which means so many people are creating content, which means it's much harder for an organization to get cut through than it used to be. So that's the big strength and weakness of Facebook. One of the other big advantages with Facebook right now is the targeting. There is amazing ad platform, and I know there's changes with the new iOS rollout, but there is amazing targeting features available where you can get to specific target markets, both organically with your content and with paid content as well. So that's probably one of the biggest opportunities with Facebook is you can narrow down to a really niche audience, which is harder to do sometimes with Instagram or Twitter. So I'm definitely going to recommend Facebook to you if you are engaging with an older audience, if you have a broader demographic, so you are talking to people who are in multi-different generations, Facebook's going to be most effective. If you want to reach someone like me, a mum with a primary school age child is three times more likely to engage with your content than any other demographic group. And of course, we're also the prime age for funding and donations for a charity as well. So that's some of the opportunities, but people go to Facebook not to connect with brands and businesses. We go on Facebook to connect with cherished friends and family. So if you're doing Facebook well, you have to be really human, really vulnerable, um, really honest, really friendly with your language and not go too corporate. Otherwise, it's just not going to serve you. All right, Instagram's our next cab off the rank in terms of size with 9 million Australian active users. You might know that Instagram is owned by Facebook. Uh, so obviously some of the features do carry across between the two platforms, but they are still really different. So don't just duplicate your content across both. They are, have different audiences, different algorithms, different features. Um, like for example, Facebook has the embedded Facebook fundraising donation feature, which is available currently in Australia, in the US, in Canada, not in New Zealand yet, just so you're aware. So 9 million active users on Instagram, you can still build more of an organic following or a free audience following on Instagram much more easily than Facebook. It is getting harder. We're starting to reach that tipping point where that is harder, but you can use things like hashtags to reach new audiences and build organic following still. It's definitely the platform to use if you're comfortable with creating images and video because it is very much driven by those kind of visuals. And while slightly more female skewed, over the last 12 months, we've seen more of a balance between male and female users on Instagram. Um, there's definitely still that focus on aspirational and inspirational imagery. So I'm going to use it if you've got the opportunity to create visuals. Um, and if you want to skew slightly younger with your audience, because uh, again, my audience, we're really active on Instagram and it increases as we get younger. Around 75% of all users are under the age of 35 now on Instagram. So we're definitely starting to reach a little bit younger audience. Snapchat, 6.4 million active users. It has died off a lot in terms of strategies that I recommend for not-for-profits because Instagram stories and LinkedIn stories and Facebook stories started to take over that same element that we were getting from Snapchat. Um, Snapchat is great if you're trying to reach university students and younger audiences. They're great for early adopters. It's good for people who want that kind of exclusivity that you don't get on other platforms. Now, if you have specific questions on any platforms, now's the time to jump in a chat and ask those. And I can touch on a couple of those before I move on to our next section. LinkedIn is probably one of the single biggest opportunities out there for fundraising that's not being tapped into right now for not-for-profits. While they might not have specific custom fundraising style features on LinkedIn, there is a huge opportunity to reach corporates and get corporate donations on there. I've done a lot of great social media strategies for charities to reach corporates on LinkedIn. 
It's fantastic for volunteer recruitment. It's also fantastic from the point of view is that the big audience is white collar professionals, which tend to be higher socioeconomic audiences. So asking for money on LinkedIn is not a no-no. There is actually a huge opportunity there. And a lot of the fundraising is happening in direct messaging and personal pages rather than through a business page. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Um, so obviously it's the best platform if you want to get to students. Um, like you want to attract student volunteers or younger donors, LinkedIn's great for that. And of course, those top level executives, you can get some amazing cut through to reach those people on LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter is the next biggest at 5.8 million. Twitter's higher use in the US than it is here in Australia. Um, the biggest challenge with Twitter at the moment for not-for-profits is the speed. Most people I work with are wearing a lot of hats, super time poor, or even work part-time. Twitter generally needs rapid response and high commitment of time and frequency to do it well. So I'm only going to really recommend Twitter to you if you want to use it for advocacy, like you want to get to government officials, if you want to connect with media or your target market is really creative people, I'm going to recommend Twitter to you then. And obviously Pinterest just for comparison in terms of um, the size of audience. So a couple of questions coming through. Um, yeah, a good point from Sam. Mums are statistically more likely to be managing household finances and more likely to make donation decisions. So very, very true. Uh, Vicky, I'd be interested in advice on a starting point for diff diff oh, sorry, differentiating posts between Instagram and Facebook. So Instagram is the first priority is your image or your video. So it's much more about creating videos for reels, IGTV. They heavily weight video content. And it's about creating striking curated images in your feed. The text is secondary. Whereas on Facebook, there's a lot more opportunity to play with longer form storytelling. So that's one of the fundamental differences. The way people use the platform is quite different and the target markets are quite different between the two. So what I'd really look at identifying for you, Vicky, is how do you actually differentiate? What are you trying to achieve on Instagram? And what are you trying to do on Facebook? So Instagram could be a different audience, a different market. It could be a younger audience. And Facebook might be where you get to your little bit older audience. That's when my content would start to diverge. So I hope that makes sense. All right, fantastic. I'd love to know if there was anything in that particular presentation that surprised you about the social media platforms. Because there's often something that people go, I never knew that about this platform or that platform. I would love to know if anything particular jumped out and surprised you. So do let me know in chat if you have anything that particularly stood out. Um, and obviously the reality is there's so many different forms of digital marketing. There's podcast paid ads, there's Google, there's affiliate marketing, there's blogging, there's EDM, and all of those things do tie back into what we're doing here in terms of how to activate your community as well. All right, I'm mindful of time. I've got to smash through this. Section two is who. It's really important important you know who you're talking to. What I get from a lot of not-for-profits is we don't mind who donates. We're happy if it's an 18-year-old or an 80-year-old. It doesn't matter. We want everybody's donation. Unfortunately, that is not the way to approach social media fundraising because social media is about building community and being social and you have to be super clear who your ideal donor is on each platform and who you're talking to. Otherwise, your content will be so generic it won't connect with anyone, you won't create any kind of emotion and it's gonna fall flat. So if we look at this image, we've got our kind of the guy with the, his uh, jumper cardigan tied around his shoulders, what he's gonna care about, want or be motivated by, or what's gonna to appeal to him is really different than if we drop down a couple of rows to our um, bearded hipster dude. Very different motivation, very different financial situations. So if you tried to create a message that engaged them both successfully, I can tell you now, you're not going to engage either of them. They're just not going to connect with you. So that's the biggest mistake people make. So consider different platforms for different audiences. You might use LinkedIn for your corporate donors. You might use Facebook to get to some of your older donors. And you might use Instagram to get to a younger audience, for example. You also need to think about your voice. How, if your organization was a person, how would they speak to people? If you've never thought about that, chances are your content doesn't have a clear voice or you're just defaulting to how you would speak to people and how what you're interested in. 
that's going to be a mistake if you're trying to reach a demographic that's not the same as you. So think about it. If you're a medical research charity, are you the friendly family GP who has expert knowledge but knows how to break it down into everyday language? Are you a friend chatting about the problem over coffee, about you know, the challenges that your kids are facing with heart problems right now? Who's your voice and who do you speak for and how do you speak to them? Now, the other most common question I get in this workshop is what time of day do I post? So I'm gonna share some different research and stats. So here's some peak times, here's some different peak times and here's some quite different ones again. The reality is we tend to get a bit caught up is when the peak times are for link clicks or the peak times are for engagement or reach. The reality is peak times can be a curse because they're also the time when the most people are online and most people are creating their content. So always ask yourself, is your audience average or unique? For example, I worked with a not-for-profit who connects with women who live on um, farms and in rural communities. What was unique about that audience is they get up with the sun. So when we started posting at sunrise every day on social media, their engagement went through the roof. Why? Because there weren't as many people online during that time, so we got way better cut through than if we'd posted at the peak audience time. Does this make sense for everybody? Awesome. Now, um, best time to post? There is no such thing as a single best time to post. There's only the best time for your audience. So for Facebook, for example, you can find that out by going and looking at your insights page. You can look at the post tab and it will show you the best times when your audience is most likely to be online. Just bear in mind, Facebook recently changed this. So it shows the times in US Eastern Standard Time. So you will have to convert the time to your local time zone. It used to show it in your local time zone. I don't know why they changed it. It's crazy, but there you go. Um, so this example we're looking at, if we assume this is in our time zone, you can make assumptions about this audience. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to who this target market is? So you can see they're not online till close to 9am. They peak around 3, 3.30pm in the audience in the afternoon where they're using social more. They kind of go up till about 9, 9.30 and then sharply drop off after that. Like not to be stereotypical, but who do we think this target market might be? Does anyone want to have a guess for me in chat? It's amazing how much you can tell about your market based on this little graph that you see. This one, I think, looks a bit like a whale. Um, but we often see, for example, university student market, it goes like this when we look at our chart because they're very low activity early in the morning going through to high activity late in the evening. Uh, yeah, so Vicky, you've nailed it. So Vicky has said parents, Sam said mum. Um, absolutely. So it's our parent demographic, absolutely, because we're peaking at 3, 3.30 when our kids are finishing school and we're waiting for them at school pickup and or taking them to sports and we're bored, so we're on our phone and we drop off fairly early in the evening because we're all so tired, we've gone to bed. <laughs> so you can read a lot about your audience from this. You can also see things here like um, your demographic, male, female, and your age group and where in the world they're joining you from as well in our people section. So it's really useful to look at. I also want to mention about peak times. If you're not already scheduling your content in advance, it's definitely something you should be doing. You can do it natively on Facebook through Creative Studio. You can do it on Twitter through a tool like TweetDeck, or you can invest in something like Hootsuite, which can be free for up to three social media profiles. Um, and this is what Creative Studio looks like. You just go to create post and then down the bottom, you can schedule it to come out at a particular time. So you don't have to actually be using your social media at that set time to get your content out to them. So that's how you can do things at sunrise and sunset without working all the hours in the day. So how does knowing your who and the when make a difference to your social media? The biggest mistake I see people making all of the time with their social is trying to talk to a really broad audience, thinking the more people we can engage, the more effective we're going to be. The truth is the opposite is true. It's only when you actually go, 
our ideal audience, our ideal outcome is from our social media page for 2021 is to raise money. That's our number one priority. And we think we're going to raise money from mums with primary school age kids. And we really map out that profile. And we start talking to those mums in their language, in their words, in the things they worry about, the things they think about. And we try and connect them to our cause that's when your results are going to start happening. If you're trying to run Facebook fundraisers or ask for donations and nothing's happening, it's because you haven't primed that audience. You're not talking to them in a way they can resonate with because you're trying to keep things too broad. And of course, if you post at the wrong time of day, if your target market's to get me to donate and you're posting every morning at 7.30, 8 in the morning, you're just going to miss me entirely because that's when I'm trying to get dressed for work, make my child put his shoes on after I've asked him 37 times not to get smear yogurt all over my dress before I leave the house. That is not a good time to try and ask me for money. Instead, that show the best time to ask my demographic for money is at 7.30 at night till eight o'clock at night. That's usually when our kids have just gone to bed. Um, we're sitting down, we've relaxed, maybe had a glass of wine, we're scrolling through our social and then we see a really emotional plea and we're in that kind of really vulnerable time where we've had the bedtime cuddles, our kids are adorable again, not annoying, and we've relaxed. That's the prime time to get us to donate. So that's when you need to be telling those really emotional stories, and including those kind of pleas. All right, third section is our what. What are we actually trying to post about and when? A lot of people get stuck here. I teach a really simple model. I believe there's only four types of posts you ever need to do on social media and you just rotate and circulate these four all of the time. What we're trying to do here is actually take people from, I don't really know who you are and what you're about to taking action, like maybe a donation or volunteering or become a customer or whatever it is you need them to do. So you need to move them through the process. So how we do that? vision and values. Where is your organization going? Why does it matter? And what do you value? So I can align and connect emotionally with you. Then a conversation starter is about um, engaging with me. You ask me a question, I respond, we have a conversation, I realize you're real human beings and connect with you. And I feel valued by your community. Then we have education, which is education posts are all about what's in it for me. Education is the easiest way for a not-for-profit to give value to your community. A lot of us forget, particularly when we need funding, that it's not all about what our organisation needs. For someone to be engaged in our social media communities, we need to think about what's in it for them. And giving them education and knowledge and information is one of the best ways to nurture and give value to our community. Then lastly, when we have our product or brand post, when we actually ask for something, and product and brand sounds weird in fundraising terms, but a product or brand post is a, this is a service we offer, this is our call to action for donations and funding, um, this is anything we need as an outcome post, then people are much more ready to take action because they align with your values, they understand your vision, they've had conversations with you, they've learned something from you, and now you're asking for something in return you're much more likely to get a better outcome. All right, awesome. Let's keep going. Vision and value. So let's look at a couple of examples. So vision is the where am I going and why does it matter? One of the biggest mistakes I see when I, I so you can get us to, for example, do an audit of your social media and come back with recommendations. One of the things I often see when I'm doing audits or processes like that is, I can go through a month's worth of content, sometimes even two months. And what I don't see is what your vision is. What is the point of your organization? Where are you going and why should I be following you? Why is that something I really should believe in and want to support? Are you going to cure MS in the next 20 years? Are you trying to ensure everybody with MS actually has the best possible quality of life? I need to know what that vision is, that wild, crazy dream you're trying to achieve is because I need something to follow to make me a loyal fan. Our values are what are the fundamental things your organization believes? And if you had to list, you know, three to five values you want people to take away from your social media about who you are and what you believe, what would they be? You know, they could be 
fun and happy and bright it could be responsible professional it could be you know it could be anything it could be family friendly it could be um you know the, the list is endless so I'm not talking about corporate values I'm thinking what are the key things people want to get a sense of emotionally from your social media so just look at this picture for me jump in the chat what is a value that we assume about this organization based on the photo so don't worry about the text or the organization what are we assuming about the value of this organization based on the image someone jump in the chat and let me know what you think what words kind of come to mind with their values fun from taryn yes fun vicky fun friendly joyful uh sam young and fun joy from toby um, so we get a really good sense, Isabel, happy. So can you see how just the image they've chosen makes us feel something about them? Yes, yeah, celebrating from Carolyn, excited from Isabel. Like these are almost instinctive things that we take into our brain about this brand. And Camp Quality deals with critically ill children. So you think it could be quite a, a you know, a sad thing but they are very careful to make their brand joyful and happy and bright and colorful. And these things come through in this image. Now, the interesting thing is I presented this and I had people from Camp Quality in the room. And what they actually pointed out is, can you see the people at the bottom of the image? They're actually Camp Quality team members as well, but that's the board and the executives. If you look closely, you can see they're actually wearing tuxedos and white bow ties. So that are a formal event. What would we instead have thought their values were if they dropped the camera a row and taken a photo of that row of those, you know, four men across the front in their white tuxedo, white ties and tuxedos? I don't think you'd be saying fun and joyful and excited and celebrating. Like Sam says, corporate, totally. Maybe you'd use words like professional or serious or stable, very different values based on the image. So think about what values you're projecting in your content without even meaning to. Let's look at another example of vision and values. This one's from Gifted WA, who's a client, and they're happy for us to share this data. They only have like five or 600 people liking their page, yet this post reached 6, 7,630 people. Most social media managers will tell you this post is wrong. The image is a graphic and it's not super eye-catching and engaging. The text is long and wordy. Why it works, they are so clear on their target market and what they care about that this lands really well with their audience and ultimately drove them to get more members and more people they were able to help. So gifted and twice exceptional students are being specifically catered for in a new New South Wales education poli um, policy with the premise that every child needs to learn. If you're the parent of a gifted child who is struggling, who's getting in trouble, who's getting arrested, who's getting suspended because they're not being catered for, you're going to see that and go, yes, they do. That's good vision and values-based content. Um, one from Sexual Health Quarters, they shared during the pandemic of showing their team doing whatever it took to keep supporting people through that time. That's a great example of vision and values. Um, so education-based posts, as I said, this is how we give value to our audience, the what's in it for me. World Vision are great at this. They're really good at educating people and they often use video, which is the far most compelling type of content. We engage uh, people 10 times more with a video than usually uh, text. So they are really good about educating people with what is going on in the world or what they're doing. Um, here's another example of a really simple, basic education post from Firefighting Australia, where they basically show that 53% of children charge their phones under their pillows. But what the danger of that is, they show really visually here. This was shared 861 times because it's high value education that I see and go, I'm going to share that with my friends so they know the danger to their children as well. Again, understanding of target market and audience and what's going to motivate me to take action. Valiant Children's Initiative, another amazing client, did this huge long form piece of content. Like you can click continue reading, it goes on and on and on. Um, but it talks about the emotional impact on children in the world today. This one post has been seen half a million times. And again, this is a small not-for-profit, so huge impact. Conversation starters, basically the purpose of these is to get people to engage with you. Because what happens when people engage with you? Like they build a relationship, all those good things, but actually more importantly, 
It, it tells the algorithm that sits behind Facebook and Instagram and our other platforms that this content is really relevant. It's really engaging. And those platforms do what? They push your content out for free to more people. So I want one in every four posts to be for the sole purpose of driving your engagement up. Even if it's not about your cause, even if it's not about your core purpose, it will get you ultimately better outcomes from your social. Here's just something funny we shared. Um, this is the rural fiction author I mentioned before who was trying to reach women in rural um, areas. Fleur and her brand and now her not-for-profit, they're kind of cheeky. They've got a little bit of sense of humour. They shared this picture, like if this made you smile. It was shared 862 times and increased um, the likes on their social page by about 20%. It was crazy, went viral. Another one from Carbon Neutral Charitable Fund. Something really simple, engaging. Look what happens when you cut down too many trees. So it doesn't have to be serious. This reached over 3,000 people, even though they actually only have a really small audience of, say, 500 people following their page. Reachout.com, fantastic example of engagement style posts. Congratulations, you made it out of bed. Unless you didn't, in which case you can again tomorrow. How easy is it to buy a blackboard and write an inspirational message and take a photo of a post? So simple and easy. This was shared 426 times and reached 4,500 people in terms of engagement. The size of the audience they reached would have been way beyond that. So you can turn any type of post into a conversation starter by asking something like, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel about this? What's the word that best describes why? Yes or no, love this or hate this. Caption this photo for us. What do you think is happening here? Um, also just asking people to get involved. Like we need your help with, we're coming up with a new brand. Do you think we need to do this or this? Or we're gonna paint this wall behind Sammy's desk. Do you think it should be blue or orange? Um, we need your feedback on this new thing we've just created. What do you think about it? Or we need your feedback on what's the biggest challenge you're facing around why? Your advice is needed. What do you think? Those kind of things turns any post into a conversation starter. All right, your last post, your fourth post is product and brand. And this is where we tell people what it is we need from them and how they can help us. This one's from Humans Helping Dogs, a very small not-for-profit that was just starting. We helped her come up with a campaign where they um, had people in their social media community knit greyhounds to her pattern, post them to her, and then she auctioned them on social media. Sounded a bit wild, right? The average auction price for one of her greyhounds is $80. Um, so she has in the last Giving Tuesday event, I think she raised about $6,000 in a couple of days through these knitted greyhounds. Simple, easy, low cost, highly engaging, beautiful content for social media, effective outcome. There's all sorts of different types of things you can ask for as well. Like here's an example of an ask style post and the outcomes from Karak and Black Cockatoo Conservation. On the left, they did Facebook fundraiser asking for money um, to replace their clinic freezer and they easily raised the money they needed. On the other side, they realised they were spending a lot of money on office staples and supplies. So they did a call out saying we need paper, paper towel, cleaning products. Somebody did the whole order and just sent it to them, which was amazing. So these are kind of things you can potentially achieve. Uh, Fitted for Work did a landing page on their website where they just talked about all the different things they needed to make their office more comfortable for the people they were trying to help and get back into the workforce. So they told a really compelling story and people just went on there and committed to donate to buy the different things they needed. Fantastic fundraising example. All right, I would love you to jump into chat and tell me what's the most valuable idea you've had from this so far. What's the one thing you're going to take away and implement um, in the next couple of days on your social media? Jump into chat and let me know. I'm just going to share a couple of quick best practices just to finish this up. Don't underestimate video. Facebook video views are 8 billion average daily video views. In fact, there are more videos watched on Facebook now than YouTube. So if you can incorporate video into your social content, that's where the best results are coming from right now. And I highly encourage it. You're always better off sharing native content. So content that you created than third party content. Those of you in Australia would have seen the Facebook news ban that just happened where thousands of not-for-profits got caught up and had their, uh, their pages blocked. 
that's because too many charities are relying on sharing news articles and links because they don't know what to create themselves. That's why the site got to the point, the algorithm determined they were news outlets because they share so much news content, which is really disappointing to see. So we want to see native content created about your organisation and not just sharing links from other people's stories. Another great tip, always give value to your community before asking for things. Too many not-for-profits get caught in this constant ask. Hey, we need $5, give up your coffee today and donate. We need a volunteer for next Thursday. We need, we need, we need, we need. And we forget that our audience needs things too. And we need to give them value and connect them emotionally before we ask for things. So just to recap, we've talked about our three pillars, our where, our who, and our what, and our best practices. So what you need to do from here to implement on this class is Identify what's unique with your organisation. What do you have that no one else does? Do you have lots of time? Do you have cute puppies? Do you have, um, you know, something unique in the position you're in, in the market? You're the only people who provide that particular service you provide. Use that and really own that on your social media. You also need to create a plan. So actually sit down from this workshop and write down your where, your who and your what and start planning out your content based on these pillars. Set your mission for your social media channels, like know why you're using your social media and what success will actually look like. Think about your resources, make sure you have the people and the time to create and monitor your content properly. And of course, keep learning. You know, I have a free Facebook group called Change the World. You're welcome to jump in and request access to that. It's open to all not-for-profits and causes around the world. And we share lots of tips and updates about social media. There's also some other great ones called Social Media Geek Out with Matt and Navara. There's Australian Community Managers. And of course, you can keep learning by looking at what other charities and not-for-profits are using online. Um, so just to reset this again, uh, our Facebook group is called Change the World. You'll see a picture of me on the little profile. So you can request that social media geek out with Matt Navara and Australian community managers have lots of really good social media updates that could be useful. So implementing, decide if you're on the right platforms or not. Know who you want to talk to and make sure you clarify that. Check if you're talking to the right audience at the right times of day or not. And then actually sit down and start planning out some content using the four categories I shared. Awesome. I'm going to take questions now. So there are a couple of things that have come through that I haven't seen. But just to quickly jump in, it's lovely to see you sharing what resonated with you as well. So Anthony said starting a conversation on social media, asking your audience. So Sam, that resonated with you as well. Vicky said she's going to change her approach on Instagram a little, focusing a bit more on video and less copy um, and ensuring you're posting the vision and values. That's a fantastic takeaway. Um, and Sam, also education, that you have to be more intuitive and think about real value there. So I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Sam, let me know if there are some questions I missed that I can jump into as well. And obviously all my details are on the screen. You can follow me on all the social media channels and keep asking questions even after this session is done. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Alicia. We've got um, a question just a little while back from Vicky. Um, and so this is going into mm -hmm. some time zones again. So our platforms are international. So targeting moms is a little bit more complicated due to time zones. What is a starting point for addressing the time zone differences? And please, I will be listening in as obviously international conferences yeah. kind of apply. <laughs> Absolutely. And look, it's a challenge we face as well, because um, likewise, we have different things for different audiences. And this is where the importance comes from having a really clear social media strategy, because the truth is you have different audiences coming along at different times. So sometimes you have to test and experiment. Um, I just did a podcast episode about repurposing content. Sometimes that's key and going, right, well, I know we have a really big mum group in the US and in Australia that we want to connect with. And we have a couple of different time zones within that, whether we want West or East Coast. So what we need to do is actually find out the peak times to post to those mums in each of those markets. And then we need to repurpose and tell the story in little pieces over time and spread those out between those peak time zones. And then of course, analyze that. Look at your analytics afterwards, which ones worked, which ones reached the most people and in which time zone, which ones actually got the most engagement and outcome. Um, that's gonna work for you. 
obviously sometimes you have to make key decisions. So when we just ran an international conference recently, we looked at our different platforms and went, predominantly our Facebook has our Australian and New Zealand community. So we posted at the peak times for those audiences on our Facebook, whereas LinkedIn, we'd really built up a lot of our international audience. So I made the point of when I did a LinkedIn live video, making sure the time zone was, you know, maybe in the evening for our US audience where it was still first thing in the morning, which is also a peak LinkedIn time for our Australian audience. So I got the chance to kind of connect with both of them. It does take strategy, it does take planning, and I strongly recommend just testing lots of different time zones and relying on the data rather than your instinct in terms of what has worked best for you. Perfect, and I think that's applicable across any industry that you find yourselves in now and into the future. So you mentioned having a Facebook group. Is it worthwhile to create a Facebook group for my nonprofits, donors and supporters? That's coming in from Dylan. Oh, great question. So there's a, a big debate of pages versus groups. So generally I'm using a Facebook page as kind of like your front door. That's your public facing brand. That's where people might come and find you for the first time. It's where you might get people who are really new to you. The way I would use groups is for people that already have come across you before. Like, for example, some of you might join in that Change the World Facebook group because you've seen me speak. You've already built a bit of a relationship. You know what I do. You've got a bit of background. And inside that group, I can give you value by sharing updates on what's new around the social media, like much more nitty gritty stuff that's not going to work on a public facing page. Some strategies that work really well for groups, I would really think about what you want to achieve from that group because it for a group to work well, you need your audience and community posting as often as you are, if not more often. So you don't want to set up a group to nurture donors. If donors have no questions and they don't want to talk to each other, there's no benefit in creating a donor group because it's just going to be you going, oh God, I've got to find something to post and, and put in there. And there'll be no community. It works really well for volunteers, for example. So we've had really great groups where... Um, all of an organization's volunteers are in there. Like someone like Lifeline did this well. And they had people talking about the difficult phone call they took earlier and how they dealt with it and asked for advice on if anyone else had any suggestions. Or people would talk about feeling a bit burnt out or needing a bit of motivation. Or somebody would even go in there and go, hey guys, I have to cancel my shift this afternoon. My, my child's sick, can someone jump in and take it? Like that created a really great sense of community. Um, I probably haven't seen groups used as effectively as a donation mechanism yet. So great question though. Um, and as well, based on um, having a group in a community like that, would that help in creating user-generated content? And how much should our non-for-profit audiences mm. be asking their supporters for user-generated content? User-generated content is super important and really useful because um, at the end of the day, if you're always creating everything on your own, that's a big burden of work. Whereas anything you can do where you can get people in your community creating images and videos and sharing stuff, that's massively rapidly increases your ability to do stuff. And we know because social media is social, it's about connecting people with people. Content from other people like the other people in your audience is going to work better than content that's about you as an organization. So for example, if you look at an event like this, and can I suggest, I would highly love everybody in this session to take a few seconds. Let's actually, let's do it together. Get out your phones or your smart device and take a photo of the screen and what we're doing right now and take a nice photo of your like setup and your community and um, post it on social media, post it on Instagram, post it on Facebook and say you're attending this conference now um, and something that you learned or, you know, that creates great engagement. And of course, it creates great user generated content for the team at Keela. So when they have their next conference, they could use pictures you shared from this conference and insights you shared on social media, which is great. Plus, it's really interesting to let people in your community know what kind of training and things you've been doing as well. So generally to encourage user-generated content, make sure you share if you have a hashtag for your event or thing that's happening or for your community or your group so people can use that hashtag. Make sure you let people know how to tag you. So obviously I'm at Hancock Creative or at Alicia Hancock on all the social channels. So you can tag me in any post. Um, and obviously it's uh, killer.co, I think on Facebook. Um, is that the same on all the channels? It is, yes. Great. 
so you can um, tag Keila in what you're doing as well. And that creates community because you can all look at what each other is doing then and engage with other attendees at an event. So user-generated content, big thumbs up from me. I would always encourage people to do it because it's so much better to get photos of your users using your services or your donors talking about why they donate. It's going to be so much more impactful than you talking about why they donate. Thank you so much for that. I think we've got time for one more question, which um, is, awesome. is it better to use the donation button on Facebook or to drive potential donors directly to my website's donation page? Such a great question. So the pros and cons of that is um, people don't like leaving Facebook and Facebook doesn't like what people leaving Facebook. So it won't weight it as highly and it won't be seen by as many people if you're driving them to a third party site, unless you're doing a paid campaign. So that's one of the disadvantages of pushing them elsewhere. People like to donate natively on Facebook now. In fact, we've seen in the last um, 12 months a huge shift. So pre-bushfires, 9% of Australians had donated through a Facebook fundraiser. By the end of the bushfires, 49% of all Australians had donated through a Facebook fundraiser. Wow. Huge shift. People are really willing to do it. But the downside with the Facebook fundraiser is you can't connect collect the donor data yet. So you get very little information about who donated and how. Um, for those of you in Australia, I'm doing actually doing a presentation for Connecting Up, one of our other partners on Thursday, where I'm going to be talking about Facebook fundraising, a whole workshop. So check that out if you want to know more about how Facebook fundraisers work. Um, but they're kind of the, the pros and cons. Natively within Facebook, I highly recommend you get behind Facebook fundraisers because they work. We've got a lot of clients that are getting really good passive weekly income when they're not actually doing anything, but people in their audience are raising money for them. That's not going to happen the same through your website. So my best suggestion is your strategy should incorporate both and test both and get the best of doing both. Paid advertising strategies, totally send them to your website. Organic Facebook fundraising, do it through the native website as well. But if you're not doing both, try because you're probably losing out on one part of the market or the other. And I'll just leave you with an interesting stat that came out of, um, I met the head of social impact from Facebook a year or so ago. And she told me that the stats show that um, nearly 70% of people the, under the age of 25 have only ever made a donation natively through a social media platform. So if you're not asking for money through social media yet, that audience is just getting older and it's going to get harder and harder to raise money unless you're online. That's absolutely something to take into consideration. Thank you so much for that. And thank you as well, just for the entire 60 minutes that we just had. That was really enlightening. Um, I think you've left a lot of people feeling inspired and ready to put pen to paper or I guess finger to keyboard um, and start crafting their stories using those three pillars. I'll just pop my last screen up. No problems. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope I wasn't talking too fast for everyone. I know I kind of brain dumped pretty quickly, but I want to make sure you get a lot of good information in a short period of time. So I do hope you really enjoyed that. And thank you so much to Sam and the team at Killer for um, having me.